My name is Mark Hallett. I'm the Director of Studies at the Paul Mellon Centre and I'm delighted to be sitting having a conversation with Professor Jules Brown, Paul Mellon Professor Emeritus of History of Art at Yale University. And I'm here to talk to Jules about an artist who he's worked on a great deal, John Singleton Copley, and Copley's engagement with the world of graphic art with prints. Copley, of course, is known for his portraits of colonial Americans, oils and pastas and miniatures, and I guess even more famously for his English history pictures. But the connection between Copley and Prince seems, at least to me, relatively obscure. Mm -hmm. So it would be wonderful to hear more about this connection from you, Jules. Yeah, it's very little known, but Copley was, in fact, involved with the world of Prince from the very beginning until after his death. When he was 10 years old, his widowed mother married Peter Pelham. Pelham had been a medicine engraver, well, sort of a minor or middle level medicine engraver young in London and came to America, I think in 1727, had a fairly successful career here. There wasn't that much demand for it, but there was some for Metzleton portraits, which he did. Toward the end of his life, he married the widow Copley. So between 1748, when they were married, and 1751, when Pelham died, Copley was in the studio of a Metzleton engraver and exposed to all the tools and implements. But Pelham also was a painter. He didn't paint many. There's only one surviving oil painting that's not in very good condition. But he was exposed to you know, just the smell and the feel of an artist's studio. Yeah. Plus the fact that there are prints and books and portfolios, all sorts of things. If you're in the American colonies, there's no museums. There's no place to go see art. There's no Europe. <laughs> so no. you're starved for visual images. So this was a very important beginning, and he's oriented toward art. Pelham dies when he's 13, and Copley apparently feels some responsibility for his family. He has a half-brother, he's a couple years younger, and a widowed mother. When he's 15 years old, he starts to produce pictures. And one of the first things he produces is a print, which is a portrait of uh, Reverend William Wellsteed, 1753. <laughs> it's not as original a move as one might think, because what he does is he takes one of his stepfather's plates which was a portrait of the Reverend William Cooper of 10 years earlier. And he planishes out the likeness. And in fact, if you look at the Wellseed, you can see the sort of halo behind the head. You can see where he's rubbed it out yes. and put in the likeness of Wellseed. And then, because the names are so similar, he only had to take out Cooper and put in Wellseed, and that took care of the titling. And then he just took out his stepfather's name. So he takes out Pelham, and he puts in his own name in the lower left as the artist. And he's in business. He's in business, yeah. indeed, and that's a very interesting substitution. Copley also, I know, early in his career, produces mythological paintings. Right. And are they as engaged with the world of print as something like this? Oh, absolutely. And I'll talk a little bit about the specifics of that. But what that move is, is an indicator that not only does he want to be an artist, but he wants to be an artist operating at the highest level of the profession, which is history painting. Yeah. That is the painting of historical, mythological, religious pictures in which the artist has to bring together a number of figures and have them all interacting appropriately in terms of gesture, pose, expression, dress, background. It's much more complicated than just simply replicating an individual or a landscape or a still life or whatever it is. So he wants to be not only just a painter, but he wants to be working at the highest level of the profession. So he begins very early with history paintings. One of them is the Forge of Vulcan, 1754, the next year. And that comes directly after an engraving by Tardieu after Coypel. It's virtually the same print. So that is a clear indication of what his aspirations yes. were in that direction. He produces a number of these things. One of the very good ones is The Return of Neptune. And here he takes the composition from a very similar painting, almost identical, Return of Neptune by Ravenet after Casali. He would have heard of Ravenet through Smybert. Smybert, like Pelham, was an English-trained artist who came to America very early, settles in Boston, and lives only a couple of blocks away from Copley. So Copley knows Smybert. He knows Smybert's work. Smybert also had a collection of copies of old master paintings, plaster casts. It was the closest thing to a museum. It was right just down the street. And Smybert in London, like Pelham, would have known Ravenet, because Ravenet was a well-known figure in London in the middle years of the 18th century. So he takes that picture, 
and makes some minor changes. He adds a clouded sky at the background. And of course, he's moving from black and white to color. So he's introducing color as something new. He also decides to make a pendant picture to Neptune, which is Galatea, which is based on an engraving after the Venetian artist Gregorio Lazzarini of Galatea. And here he makes some other changes. And in particular, since he wants to have these as pendants, uh, he crops the image. And that brings the figure of Galatea closer to the foreground, which makes it similar in size to the Neptune. And then he makes some minor changes. He moves one of the cupids around, he moves the position of the trident, and he closes the composition that would be made by pendants as opposed to the composition of a single picture. That's really interesting to have seen that in action, those reworkings of prints that he would have seen and would have been circulated and disseminated to the colonies from London and from Paris, I imagine. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole issue. Of, you know, if, if you're in the American colonies in the 18th century and you want to be an artist, you know, what are your options? Mm -hmm. They're very limited in terms of what you can do. So they're very dependent on books, on prints, any kinds of illustrations. There are very few European paintings here. In relation to this issue of his training, we've seen him working directly from a portrait print, and now we've seen him looking at a range of and working from a range of prints depicting mythological, historical subjects. But there's also this very interesting anatomy book. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, it's a fascinating object. It's actually in London in the record office because, well, it gets into a later story, but it was when Copley eventually goes to England and his half-brother Henry Pelham goes, this book goes with him and it gets confiscated <laughs> when they, when they, and, and it ends up owned by the government. In 1756, Copley, with this ambition to be a history painter, makes a personal manuscript anatomy book for his own use. Because he knows that to do these mythological paintings, you have to understand the human figure and how the human anatomy works. That's fundamental. So he starts copying things from several sources. One is from anatomy approved and illustrated by Bernardino Genga and Giovanni Maria Lancisi. There, there are individual plates, individual figures. So just to make it more compact and more useful, he just combines them. He puts the two of them together. So uh, you get this one of two human torsos, a front and a back view. But he puts them into a single plate. From another source, from a Dutch source, Van der Graak, he copies the plates from Van der Graak, which are individual plates, but he does two things. One is he flips them, he reverses them. And the other thing he does is he takes the written text, which is on different pages in the source, and puts it on the same page. He puts it right on the page where he has the illustrated image. And what's also a very interesting aspect of it is that he makes changes. So they're not exactly the same as the source because they are more up to date. And that means he's talking to some physicians in Boston, and there were some, A, who were interested in art, who had art books, but also had studied in Edinburgh, and they knew some of the changes that had been made in the understanding of the human anatomy. So he's updating it in that way. Then another twist on it is that van der Graak, in making his book, takes it directly from the first great book on human anatomy, the Vesalius, the Humani Corpus Fabrica. What van der Graak did when he took it from Vesalius was he flipped the images, and then Copley quite consciously flips it back again. So that flipping is not just part of a tracing and copying process, but actually is intentional. And the evidence of that is that Vesalius himself with the specific four plates that Copley uses in his book, those are the four plates that Vesalius indicated, and I quote him here, display a total view of the scheme of muscles such as only painters and sculptors are wont to consider. So they were not in there for doctors and physicians, they were there for artists, and Copley uses it that way. They're the most relevant pictures for him. Yeah, yeah. precisely. Fascinating. Is there something similar going on in the portraits that he painted right, uh, uh, during his right. time in the colonies? Yeah, yeah, it was all well and good that he wanted to be a mythological painter. But Boston, in the middle years of the 18th century, there wasn't much demand for mythological or religious paintings, uh, particularly not that kind of religious paintings. But there was a big demand for portraits. And so he responds to that. Uh, in fact, that was the market that Pelham had been responding to with his prints. But right from the start, he begins to paint portraits in 1753, the same year as the Wall Street engraving. His portrait of Mrs. Joseph Mann of 1753 was based on an English mezzotint by Beckett after William Wissing, a portrait of Princess Anne about 1683. So there's, what, a 70-year gap 
But Copley takes this source, again he reverses it, so that the opening is on the left instead of on the right, the pedestal is on the right instead of on the left. Mm. But he changes the face, obviously, and the hairdo, keeps the pearls, so he's adopting it for his own purposes. Another portrait of a similar period is the boy of the Greenleaf family, boy with a plumed turban, which comes from an early 18th century mezzotin after Sir Godfrey Neller, a portrait of Lord Burry. This one, he's making it into a detail, so he's moving in a lot closer, eliminating things, but he adds things, he adds the lamb, and so on. So he's doing these things, and he's taking these sources, Wissing and Neller, they're artists who, you know, half century or more earlier, and I don't think it's because it's the only thing that was available to him. I really think it's because it's what his sitters wanted. It's what they knew, it's what they were familiar with, it's what they thought of as a portrait. So in helping, working, and they, the sitter works with the artist to choose a, a compositional option, particularly if there are prints around and you can have your choices. They like the old ones, and so they go for that. But as time goes by, Copley begins to use more and more contemporary sources. His portrait of Chief Justice Jonathan Belcher of 1756 is taken really directly from a 1741 engraving after Thomas Hudson of William Fortescue. So there it's a 15-year gap. Hudson is the most influential of the English artists on the American portrait painters. Almost all of the up and down the seaboard of the American portrait painters are using Hudson as the source. The influence of Hudson, which of course was very influential in England too. Yes, very uh, fashionable. Very fashionable. But Copley has continued to move forward in time so that in his portrait of Mrs. Giraffeo Bowers going into the mid-60s, that's based directly after a McArdle mezzotint of Lady Carolyn Russell by Joshua Reynolds. So he moves from Wissing and Neller to Hudson, to Reynolds. He's becoming more up to date in his sources, and of course the hairdo and all these things are also of the time. There's another thing that goes on there that's really an important element of the influence of these prints, so that is the images he's looking at are black and white. And it's characteristic of Copley in particular, but also of many of the other American artists, but Copley above all, and Copley's the best of the American <laughs> colonial painters by far, is that they are very linear, they are necessarily following the prints which are black and white, they're very strong in light dark contrast, which is called chiaroscuro, or value contrast. So his pictures stand out as being very clear and sharp in that character. And also as a result, they tend to be very two-dimensional. And American paintings, when they're seen by Europeans at the time, the one thing they really criticize them as being, they don't really know how to make it three-dimensional. They don't know how to get the space into it and the form. So it's because of this dependence on, at least that's my theory, it's dependent yes. on print. He had been urged for years by Benjamin West and others with whom he corresponded to come to Europe, study, get to be a better artist. And also business is falling off. The political situation is deteriorating. People don't want to have their portraits painted. They've got other things on their mind. So he goes to England in 1774 en route to Italy and then spends a year in Italy studying the old masters, making copies, making some of his own works, and drawings, and learning, and then goes back to England and settles there. His wife and family come over, and it's a permanent settlement. He never comes back to America. In America, of course, he's known better for the 21 years he painted here, but he actually continued for another 40 years in England. So it's really a, a quite different career, although he continues to make portraits throughout that whole time. One of the pictures that a remarkable painting to my eyes, with which he made an impact and a reputation in London, when he does settle in London, is this extraordinary picture, Watson and the Shark. Mm -hmm. And in this picture and in other pictures that he paints during his time in England, does he continue this engagement with graphic art and with prints? Yeah, he does, in various ways, somewhat surprising a little bit. The first one, I guess, is just as a composition, it's very reminiscent of Rubens' Lion Hunt which was a very well-known picture. Copley had a copy of it in his own collection. And he did have a collection of prints that included, you know, well over a thousand copies or prints by old masters, Rubens, Van Dyck, Rembrandt. The Wyatt Hunt would have been one of them. But then in the specific details, particularly the boy in the water, and there have been various articles written citing possible sources for it. One of the first ones was the famous Borghese gladiator, after classical sculpture. 
So the Borghese gladiators won. The young boy in the Hellenistic Laocoon, which had recently been excavated, is another one. In Raphael's famous painting of the Transfiguration, which Copley not only saw in Rome, but also made his own version of it called the Ascension, small version, there's an astonished boy whose arms are raised in a very similar sort of pose. So that's another possible source. And there are ones in Raphael's cartoons of figures reaching into the water. So there are a lot of those sources. Now it's just sort of the traditional use of going back to earlier sources. But Copley does something here that's original and very interesting. And that is one of the characteristics of American artists, it's true of Copley, it's true of West, is that they have a tendency toward realism. And in the case of history painting, and this is where Copley is realizing his it's the beginning of his dream of becoming a history painter with multiple figures, which he found very difficult. How do you put more than one person in a picture? And he writes to Pelham from Rome about, now he sees all these pictures with lots of figures in them. It's, how, it's difficult. It's not as difficult as he thought it was going to be, but it's still tricky. But the American painters move the history painting in the direction of realism. They are the first, really, West and Copley, to move it in the direction of contemporary history. Plus, the prevailing theory was that in order for things to be really respectable and historical, everybody had to be wearing togas and have it in classical garb. And they say, no, no, if they're modern figures, they have to be in modern clothing and actual figures. So what Copley does here is the background is supposed to be set in Havana Harbor, where the boy, he was swimming. He was on a British ship, merchant ship, on his attack by a shark. But Copley makes it into Havana Harbor. So he looks at maps to get the setting of the harbor right and views so that the buildings in the background, uh, this is Havana Harbor, so that the convent is on the left, Moro Castle's on the right. So he's attempting to make it as real as he possibly can. He also is interested in making a print after it. So this painting, which is very dramatic, and you said you're struck by it, and even today you go into the National Gallery of the Museum of Fine Arts with the two versions of it, you just see kids come into the gallery, they're just transfixed by it. It's a very striking picture. So he has a mezzotint made of it by Valentine Green, one of the leading mezzotint engravers of the period, and that was published a few months after this, and it's very successful, very widespread. And even today you see a lot of copies after Copley that are based actually on that print. Some years earlier, Valentine Green had engraved some of the first history paintings that Benjamin West had done for George III. And they were all mezzotints. And the problem with mezzotints is that they wear down very quickly. So you can throw off maybe three, four hundred copies, but then it's pretty well done. Then you're out of business. And it's not adequate if for history paintings that are going to be popular. West is the one who made the breakthrough with his very famous painting for George III. Well, it wasn't originally for George III, but the painting of the uh, Death of Wolfe. And that was engraved by William Woollett and published by John Boydell, who's a very active British publisher. Painted in 1771, published in 1776, and that was an engraved one. And that was sold for one guinea, a copy of one guinea. And it was said that Boydell made 15,000 pounds just from that sale. And of course, West did very well from it as well. So that established the fact that it's a large market for prints after these major history paintings, and Copley picks up on that right away. So with his next major history painting, which is the death of Chatham, and he's carrying this realism a step further, he actually paints portraits of all of these individuals, and many of them became clients subsequently, and he painted individual portraits of them. And he decides not to exhibit it at the Royal Academy, which he did with Watson, but rather to put on his own show. And he exhibits it in Spring Gardens, and charges people to come see it, and takes subscriptions for an engraving to be made after it. And it was very successful. I mean, uh, 20,000 people came to see it over a six-week period. And the attendance at the Royal Academy dropped sharply because of the competition. And they lost 1,000 pounds in comparison to the previous years. So people liked it. They bought subscriptions. And in fact, the proofs, was, they wanted the early ones. And the proofs would come out first before all the text goes on it. Those are all oversubscribed. So the lesson learned there was that, yeah, it's possible to do this with engravings to make a lot of money. It was not without problems, as Copley soon discovers. Anyway, he hires one of the leading engravers, Francesco Bartolazzi, to make an engraving. And the expectation was it would be done in four years. So Bartolazzi hires a couple of assistants, Gaetano Testolini and Jean-Marie Delatra, to work on the plates. And they're working on it. And Bartolazzi is disappointed in the work by Testolini. He doesn't like it. So he hammers it out and gets rid of it. In doing that, he weakens the plate. He thins it. 
So it's less durable, it's less able to produce the number of engravings that were wanted. And moreover, it was a very slow process, and it took 10 years to finish the plate before it was finally done. So fine engraving, but that delay damaged Copley's credibility as a publisher. Because he had made a decision after Watson the Shark, which had been published by the engraver, Valentine Green, Copley said, well, that's good business, I'll do it myself. So he becomes his own publisher, and that's more complicated. It's not just being the artist, you have to sell the prints, you have to keep lists of subscribers, you have to produce them, you have to keep everybody happy, you have to pay in advance to the engraver, then you have to pay on the completion of the work. So it's very complicated. In the case of the death of Chatham, there was this delay, and in order to make it easier for people who, you know, they had sort of forgotten who these people were, <laughs> yeah. um, he publishes a key to it, which would identify the figures, and they sold that for three shillings, six pence, and people were pretty annoyed. They bought this picture, and now they have to pay extra to find out who the people were in it. <laughs> so <laughs> That's really funny. They were not very happy about that, no. in addition to having had to wait. Copley produces the key, and he also hires the assistant who had worked with Bartolozzi, Delatra, to make a small version and a cheap version that he could sell for 800 pounds. I mean, that he would pay Delatra 800 pounds for it. Part in advance, the rest to be done on completion. And when it's done, this is a small version, Copley doesn't like it. He says, it's really bad, and if I publish it, it's going to ruin my reputation. So he refuses to pay Delatra. So Delatra doesn't like that. He sues him, and the thing goes to court. When it goes to court, all of the engravers, the craftsmen, come out and they testify for Delatra. All the artists come out and they testify for Copley. And this was a reflection of what had been a long battle in the Royal Academy as to whether or not to admit engravers into the Royal Academy. Many of the artists felt, well, they're not artists, they're craftsmen. It's a different world. They stay where they belong. They don't belong in the Royal Academy. <coughs> Unfortunately for Copley, with the trial, the jury was made up mostly of craftsmen. There weren't many artists on the jury. So he lost, and Delatra won the case. So another bad experience for Copley. Turning now to the death of Major Pearson, the picture with which Copley followed the death of Chatham, was this too a picture that was very much geared to the print market? Yes, it was. And um, Copley's really at the zenith of his English career at this period. And I think producing his best pictures, I think this is the best of his history paintings and his portraits of the period were also among his very best. He began work on it in 1782, but it was not exhibited until 1784. Then he arranged to have it engraved by James Heath, another leading engraver. The painting was exhibited. It was a big hit. This is a time when the news that the English are getting from America, they're losing the colonies, they're losing battles, everything's going downhill. And here was a tremendous British triumph on the Isle of Jersey over the French, and the very dramatic picture dramatizes it. And Copley, again, makes it realistic. I mean, he's able to include some portraits of individuals, but he sets it in the town square of St. Helier, where the event actually took place. And he also included in the lower right figures of his family. His wife is the woman on the far right, his baby, and his son, John Singleton Copley Jr., later Lord Lyndhurst, and in fact, more famous than Copley the artist. In his later career, he was Lord Chancellor three times under Queen Victoria. And the fact that they knew this was going to be a major picture and important and was when it was exhibited to the public separately from the Royal Academy, Boydell had hired Gilbert Stewart, who was then studying with Benjamin West in London, to make three portraits. One of Copley, which was in the top center of the frame, one of James Heath, the engraver on one side, and one of Josiah Boydell, the publisher Boydell's brother, who was going to make a drawing from which the engraver would work. So it was a big show that was put on here. So a portrait of an engraver was displayed alongside the painting. Exactly. So that the role of engraving in relation to the painting was made really explicit. Important point, yeah. absolutely. So Heath goes to work on it, and he's very busy on it, and he uses a lot of assistance, but it's a very slow, extended process. And it was not published until 1796, even though it was painted in 82. In the 80s and 90s, Copley starts to move in other directions. I mean, here he's been doing contemporary history paintings, and he gets an idea, and West is doing the same thing. Well, what about earlier English history, the 17th century? They both paint scenes of the 17th century England, particularly around the Civil War, and trying to reconstruct them as accurately as they possibly can. Well, okay, well, they're not around there then, so how do they get that information? Well, prints was a major, major source, and whatever else they could find, coins, medallions, anything that gave them some idea of what these people look like. 
So he does some of those. They're not terribly successful, but they're what he was doing. He hoped they would be successful. And he also tries his hand at religious paintings, and he does a few of those. And they're known largely through engravings. There's one by Robert Duncarton of Abraham offering up Isaac, where in fact the painting has disappeared. Many religious pictures were thrown out in the 19th century. And this one is known only through the engraving. And whether it exists somewhere or not, we just don't know. But we know it through the engraving. That's interesting, isn't it? Because there we find engraving actually allowing an image to survive that would otherwise <laughs> disappear from view. Right. So this relationship between painting and engraving that you're opening up here is so multifaceted. Another very famous painting, the Siege of Gibraltar. Can you tell us a bit about that? And again, was this a painting that was produced to be engraved? Yes. Again, this was a major British victory this time over the combined fleets of the Spanish and the French off of Gibraltar, and therefore very popular because of the subject matter. And the city of London decides to commemorate it with a major history painting to go in the Guildhall. And this sets up a uh, competition between Copley and West, both of whom want that commission. And Copley wins it and sets to work on this enormous painting. It's 18 by 25 feet, and it takes a long time to do it. But he finishes it in 1791. He, the commission comes in 83, so it took, a, it took a long time to do it. And he worked hard on it. He got portraits of the individual people who were there. He traveled to Germany and painted oil sketches of some of the Hessian officers, the ones who were in the upper right background there and elsewhere, also in the foreground. First, he tries to hire Badalazzi again, but that falls through. And so he hires William Sharp to make an engraving. That takes a long time. In fact, the first proofs, that is things without any inscriptions or anything, don't come until 1804. And the final one's not done until 1810. That's 27 years wow. uh, for it to be finished. And by that time, many of the people who had originally subscribed to the engraving were dead. <laughs> so they, were, they were no use. And they weren't going to pay up the rest of their subscription. And lose his old hat. We're not really interested in it. So that became a problem for the sale of the print. Copley also had a recourse to prints for visual sources. It's like with the things of the 17th century. He wasn't there. He wasn't at Gibraltar. But there were people who were. So there was, for example, an engraving that was published after a drawing made by a lieutenant, G.F. Curler, who had been aide-de-camp to Lord Heathfield, the victor at Gibraltar. So Copley uses that print and the pose of Heathfield, although it's an equestrian pose in the big picture, it's the same extended arm position, so that's his source on that. Now, his last major history painting was the victory of Admiral Duncan, which was exhibited right at the end of the 18th century, wasn't it? 1799. Right. What's the print history of that painting? Uh, rather different, in a way. Copley had learned his lesson the hard way. He goes back to Mezzotin, and uh, it's not so ambitious. He hires James Ward to make a Mezzotin and be satisfied with fewer impressions. And the result is very good. Actually, the large history painting is very good. And you know, Copley's later work tends to fall off in quality, but this painting certainly does not. It's very good. And the Mezzotin is very good. And Mezzotin's, of course, are much speedier to produce than line engraving, oh, yeah. so oh, that yeah. although there are fewer impressions, mm -hmm. he could be guaranteed that the work would come out much more quickly than with the it line could. engravings, which have taken so long, exactly. so often for him. And he would sell more of them, so, you know. yeah. Uh, but even there, the sales were slow. And he had 140 of the 400 were left over. So it, it was not a complete success, but it was better. So Copley died in 1815. And five years later, there was a big sale of his estate. There was a big painting sale. But there also was a print sale. And in that print sale, there were, I think, 5,000 items or more. There were about 1,000 or 1,200 of the old masters and contemporary, Reynolds, I mean, he had a lot of Reynolds, and, but also the Rembrandts and Rubens and that sort of thing. But most of them were his own, leftovers, things that didn't sell. There were 3,800 leftover prints of these history paintings. But also, he, he, as I said earlier, he had made portraits of many of the figures, that, for example, ones who sat in for the death of Chatham. They became individual portraits. So he painted William Pitt, uh, Earl Howe, Admiral Duncan, the people who were involved with history paintings, Lord Bessborough, Earl Spencer, Viscount Sidmouth. He had some royal commissions. He painted the daughters of George III. He painted an equestrian portrait of George IV. But by and large, most of his commissions came from the nobility and the mercantile class, but not from royalty. A lot of these prints then were in his studio at his death. 
and unsold. Exactly. Mm. And so his son, Lord Lindhurst, you know, he's got these things, they, so they sell them. And the sale is a flop. I think it brings in a total of 375 pounds for almost 5,000 prints and is completely unsuccessful. So when you look back on it, you can say, okay, Copley in the course of his career is certainly influenced by, inspired by, gets ideas from the graphic arts from prints, old master and contemporary. And that's the good news. On the other hand, his experience while trying to produce them and sell the prints after them, which seemed to be so promising, in the end didn't turn out to be. And he was interviewed by the uh, artist diarist Joseph Farrington. And Farrington quotes him as saying, the difficulties of a painter begin when his picture was finished, if an engraving of it should be his object. <laughs> That's a very nice way to end. Jules Prandt, thank you very much for your insights into John Singleton Copley's multifaceted engagement with prints and print culture. Thank you very much right. indeed. I enjoyed it. Thank you for your good questions.